Tonight's event is not just another lecture. It is a response to a changing climate on campus concerning Israel and the Middle East. And many of us noticed in the last few months increasing tensions and maybe irritations among students and faculty of different backgrounds concerning some recent events. And in order to understand each other, I believe we have to listen to each other, to talk to each other, even when we disagree and even when it hurts. That is, in my view, what campus and campus debate means. But what if this becomes increasingly difficult? It is the situation, this very situation, that we would like to address tonight. No one else has written more about this topic than today's guest speaker. Kenneth Stern is the director of the Bard Center for the Study of Hate. Mr. Stern is an award-winning author and attorney, and among many other functions, he was the director of the Division on Antisemitism and Extremism at the American Jewish Committee. He has published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, and elsewhere. And he has appeared on the CBS Evening News, Dateline, Good Morning America, PBS, and many other television and radio programs. He has argued before the United States Supreme Court, testified before Congress, as well as parliamentarians in Canada and the UK. He was an invited presenter at the White House Conference on Hate Crimes, and he served as member of the US delegation to the Stockholm Forum on Combating Intolerance. Mr. Stern was an integral part of the defense team in the historic London Holocaust denial case of David Irving versus Deborah Lipstadt. He was also defense counsel for Dennis Banks, co-founder of the American Indian Movement. His newest book, The Conflict Over the Conflict, The Israel-Palestine Campus Debate, has been called a blueprint for how to navigate the conflict over the conflict on campus. He will talk to us today about his ideas, how to address this conflict. His 30-minute presentation will be followed by a discussion of two AU students, Lindsay Shavelson and Khalil Al-Sayeg. After that, the audience, both in person and from your screens, will have a chance for your questions. I really appreciate the uh, invitation. I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight, but I really look forward to this conversation, even though from my end, it's virtual. Let me start by telling you about a Bard colleague who had to make a decision this summer, whether to ask for forgiveness or permission. Bard was affiliated with the university in Afghanistan. My colleague had to make a snap decision whether to spend $3.2 million to charter two planes to get students and faculty, many of them women, out. Some of these 200 or so students are now at Bard in New York, some are at the Bard in Berlin, and some in the Bard affiliated school in, Afga in uh, Kyrgyzstan. Bard has a history of helping scholars and students fleeing oppression. When I went there as a student in the 70s, I met faculty who had came after World War II and some who fled Hungary in 1956 and were given refuge and a job. Today, I have a Bard colleague in Kenya coordinating a program for refugee students from Syria and elsewhere with classes in refugee camps in Jordan and Bangladesh. This semester, I co-taught a class with a professor from Central European University. She, like the school, had been in Budapest until Viktor Orban kicked it out because it brought liberal education there. The university is now in Vienna. I have a colleague who teaches at a college in St. Petersburg in Russia in a program that Bard helped run for 20 years. Last year, well before the war in Ukraine, Russia kicked Bard out. My colleague said he could no longer email or otherwise communicate with anyone from Bard. Look around the world today. Russia is criminalizing anyone calling war a war. Students and faculty from Ukraine, which I know some from Bard are trying to help, are just trying to survive. Faculty who speak out and students who speak out in many places in the world, such as Hong Kong and Egypt, are in jeopardy. So tonight, as we discuss the conflict over the conflict, I hope each of us is cognizant of the real luxury we have to discuss ideas, even ideas we passionately disagree with, and how many students and faculty around the world 
are so jealous of our capacity to do this in a university. I want to begin tonight and end at the same place as I did in my book, Spokane, Washington. There was a group called the Aryan Nations in the 1980s and 90s right nearby in the Idaho panhandle. It was ground zero for white supremacy and domestic terror. It spawned a group that killed Jewish talk show host Alan Berg. An Aryan Nations member named Buford Furrow shot up the Los Angeles Jewish Community Center in 1999, wounding three children and killing a Filipino postal worker. It bombed buildings. Jews in the area, when shopping for Hanukkah wrap, would sometimes find razor blades inside. When a parish priest spoke out after a local Jewish business owner was threatened, the priest's house was firebombed with him in it. Luckily, he wasn't hurt. The Aryan Nations was shut down in 2001 by a lawsuit brought by the Southern Poverty Law Center, but the end of the group also came about because of years of hard work by the local peace and justice group working together with the local Jewish community. Even after the Aryan Nations was disbanded, the danger was clear. A few years ago, a backpack was found along the parade route for a Martin Luther King Day march. Inside was a radio-controlled bomb with fishing weight soaked in rat poison and anticoagulant. Kids were on that march. Thank God it was diffused. But despite the continuing danger from white supremacy, for about eight years recently, the Jewish community and the Peace and Justice Group wouldn't work together or even be in the same room. Why? The Peace and Justice Group had a static web page promoting boycott, divestment, sanctions against Israel, and the Jewish community was calling them anti-Semites. An abstract problem thousands of miles away was preventing them from working together on concrete dangers right in front of them. It's understandable, but it's also nuts, right? As was mentioned in the introduction, I was between 1989 and 2014, the American Jewish Committee's expert on anti-Semitism. My first project was to look at the issue of anti-Semitism on campus, and I talked to many college presidents and deans and faculty members and Hillel professionals. It was very clear that if we wanted changes on how the campus should address any form of bigotry, we had to talk about what we wanted the campus to be rather than say, here's what we want you to do just about Jews. I eventually trained over 200 college and university presidents on how to treat bigotry on campus. The major debate at that time had been about hate speech codes, rules that would prescribe what could be said on campus. I argued strongly against them, and not only because of their constitutional infirmity. Strategically, they made no sense. My favorite was that of the University of Michigan. Smart people obviously wrote it. They figured out that it was a different speech interest in the classroom than in a dining hall, than in a dormitory, which is more like a home. So there were different rules for different venues. The students, of course, found the intersections on the campus and wrote in chalk free speech zones. Did the university really think that a drunk student at 2 a.m. was going to calibrate what they were saying or what they were going to say based on recognizing where they were standing? The real problem was that these discussions on limiting speech actually made the things that the university could do disappear as if into a black hole. It could survey its students to see what issues they were facing on a day-to-day -day level. It could look at training staff who might, for instance, treat black students differently than white ones. It could look at curriculum. All those things disappeared. So one lesson I learned is that to address any type of bigotry on campus, any action at least cannot harm and ideally should promote the core values of free speech and academic freedom. I'll give more evidence for that proposition in the rest of my talk, but if there's one thing to remember tonight, it's this, the requirement to uphold academic freedom if we want a university to be a university. So let me flip forward a few years about what I learned while I was at AJC. The peace process in Israel collapsed in 2000 and the second intifada became, began, excuse me, the World Conference Against Racism took place in 2001 in Durban, South Africa. And it was an orgy of anti-Semitism mixed with uh, attacks on Israel, with anti-Semitic tracts being sold, Jews being told they didn't belong, things actually praising Hitler. Then in February of 2002, the first petition circulated on campus calling for divestment from Israel. Let me make a quick segue here to provide some perspective and some data, then I'll get back to 2002. We have had 20 years since the first divestment petition. No college or university has divested. 
There are about 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States, and on most of them, Israel and Palestine aren't an issue at all. Out of 4,000 campuses, 149 had anti-Israel programs in a recent year, and routinely pro-Israel programs outnumber anti-Israel one two to one. More data. Between 2010 and 2019, there were 117 disruptions of pro-Israel speakers on campus. One is too many and a violation of ac the academic freedom of the audience to hear a speaker, but all but 16 of the talks were able to be completed and those were on 12 campuses. So clearly there are some challenges, but not nearly as ubiquitous as some pro-Israel groups allege. Now back to 2002. We saw some attacks against Jews and Jewish institutions on a few campuses that year. There was a riot at Concordia in Canada when Benjamin Netanyahu was there to speak, and there was damage to a Hillel building in Berkeley. Someone tagged it with, quote, fuck Jews. There were some other instances of intimidation and anti-Semitism, too. In San Francisco State, some uh, Jews were screamed at. Hitler did not finish the job. With a group of Jewish and non-Jewish college presidents, I coordinated a statement in response to that of 400 presidents that was printed in the New York Times. It underscored what? The university president's commitment to academic freedom and a campus open to the exploration of ideas and therefore one that also had to reject and would not tolerate harassment and bullying. Flip forward five years. 2007, the, uh, Britain's University and College Union passed a resolution in support of an academic boycott uh, of Israeli academic institutions. Academic boycotts go against the lifeblood of a university. A university exists to look at ideas, not to bar or segregate them based on the nationality of those whose ideas are being examined. So what was the ADL's initial take on it? It pondered if Israeli academics were gonna be boycotted, should the US in turn boycott British academics? You could understand the impulse, but really? I and a few others called up friends at the ADL and said, basically, what the heck are you thinking? You're giving away the best argument. Academic boycotts are anathema and you're changing the debate to academic boycotts are okay. So now let's have a conversation about who to boycott. Columbia University President Lee Bollinger wrote a statement that I helped organize into an ad that was printed in the New York Times. It said if the UCU was intent on its foolish project, which would divide the academic world into two, Israelis who should be shunned and everyone else, count us, Columbia, as Israelis too. Ultimately, 450 presidents signed onto Bollinger's statement, applying that, sentence, that sentiment to their campuses as well none would have signed on to a counter boycott. This is more evidence that anything we do on Israel and Palestine on campus has to hold up academic freedom as a basic value. So what's happening today? On the pro-Palestinian side, there are still some pushes for academic boycotts, most recently the Middle East Studies Association. Some professors have refused to write letters of recommendations for students wanting to study abroad in Israel, putting their politics in front of their duties as teachers to their students. And there's still the occasional disruption. But the pro-Israel side is also trying to stop speech it doesn't like, sometimes opposing speakers too, but most particularly through the advancement of the IRA definition, working definitions of anti-Semitism for campus application. So let me walk you through this issue. There was a group called the European Monitoring Center on Racism and Xenophobia, which is now subsumed under the EU's Fundamental Rights Agency. In 2004, it issued a report on anti-Semitism in Europe, which was a deep concern after the start of the Second Intifada as there were increased attacks on Jews. Its report found that some of the anti-Semitism came from the traditional suspects, far-right folk, but also some from some Arab and Muslim youth. The report also noted a problem that it was uh, collecting data across Europe, but there was no common definition to tell data collectors in different countries what to include or what to exclude. So as a placeholder, it said that if anti-Semitism said that anti-Semitism was a series of stereotypes about Jews, which to me is backwards. Those stereotypes are a reflection of what anti-Semitism is. But the larger problem to me was a political one. They were faced with what do you do if a Jew on the streets of Paris is attacked in reaction to something Israel does? So the EUMC said that the actor had those stereotypes about Jews, transferred them to Israelis and then retransferred them to the Jew in front of them. That was anti-Semitism and should be counted. 
But if it was because uh, he was upset about an Israeli action and attacked a Jew in front of him, that was lamentable, but shouldn't be counted. I thought this was crazy. Uh, could you imagine if a black person were lynched in the 50s or 60s and the person who did it thought blacks were shiftless and lazy? That should be counted as an act of racism. But if the murderer had been upset by a Martin Luther King speech or the passage of civil rights legislation and the poor person was hung from the same tree, that wouldn't be counted as an act of racism? So it so happened that the leader of the EUMC was coming to the American Jewish Committee annual meeting. And a few weeks beforehand, a Montreal Jewish day school was firebombed in retaliation for the Israeli assassination of a Hamas leader. Not anti-Semitism, according to the EUMC. So they gave an opportunity for me and some others to work with the EUMC on a new definition. The idea was to give guidance for bean counters and what to include and exclude. For example, there was no need to psychoanalyze a person who commits an anti-Semitic hate crime. This was a distinction between motive and intent. The key was an intent to attack a Jew or something linked to Jews because it was Jewish. There were also some examples about Israel, including hold, holding all Jews collectively responsible for the actions of Israel, and also denying Jews the right of self-determination just by claiming, such as by claiming the existence of Israel as a racist endeavor. The point was not to label anyone an anti-Semite, but to take the temperature of anti-Semitism across time and borders. Between 1975 and 1991, you had a resolution on the books that declared Zionism racism, racism, and there were instances where Jews were equated with Zionists, Zionists with racists, and Jews were discriminated, all Jews as such, such as the UK campus where Jews were not allowed to have a student association because racist student associations were not permitted. Also, we saw that there was a correlation as opposed to a claim of causation with some of this type of speech and attacks on Jews, some of which we saw again repeat last spring here. So the point of the exercise was to take the temperature these were important data points to include. Again, not to label anyone an anti-Semite, uh, you know, it was to take the temperature. So let me bring back another thing into the mix. In the US, in 2010, the Department of Education issued what's called the Dear Colleague Letter. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibited pervasive harassment or discrimination and intimidation in educational institutions that received federal money but religion, unlike race, was not a protected category. The letter said that Jews and Sikhs and Muslims as ethnicities would be protected under Title VI, and I supported this change. And in fact, I was the complainant for some Jewish high school students near Binghamton, New York, with swastikas put on their property and were bullied. There was even a kick of Jew day, and the school did nothing. The threat of a Title VI violation is that all federal funding can be cut. In this case, the school came up with a plan and stopped the harassment. But in 2010 and 11, groups like the Zionist Organization of America and some others had an idea. Let's marry this new power under Title VI with a working definition and bring lawsuits. Some of the suits complained about some actions like spitting and such, but they were replete with complaints about expression. For example, a complaint about a program about the occupation allegations that texts were unambiguously one-sided and anti-Israel, defined as anti-Semitic using the definition incorrectly too. Uh, instructor had clearly indicated her bias on an online syllabus. A program understanding Gaza was one-sided and anti-Israel, leading <laughs> students to feel emotional, intellectually threatened. There was a program on Arabs and the Holocaust, which claimed the creation of Israel was a tragedy for Palestinian Arabs showed film about the occupation, brought in a speaker. You know, all these things were proper political speech, proper teaching, but they tried to stop them and, uh, via the lawsuits. All the lawsuits failed. Then they tried to, these groups tried to get the University of California to adopt the definition and it didn't. Then they tried to get the federal legislation passed, but it failed. And eventually President Trump signed an executive order saying the definition had to be considered in the Title VI context text. One rule for opposing bigotry of any type is to change the players and see if the same rules would apply. So imagine if there were black groups after the murder of George Floyd, arguing for a definition of racism that had to be consulted in Title VI cases. By the way, there isn't. Would it include examples of political speech that might be relevant to the temperature of racism, like opposition to affirmative action or opposition to the removal of Confederate statues or opposition to Black Lives Matter or opposition to critical race theory? 
if you see the problem with such political speech being targeted in law affecting the campus, you should be concerned about similar items about anti-Semitism, given the power the government has to suppress speech is dangerous, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. My fear about the executive order then and now is not only about the legal cases, but more so about incentivizing administrators to chill or squelch pro-Palestinian speech. Since their job is to keep the universities from being sued, and there are groups like ZOA and others hunting for this type of political speech. When I testified before the Judiciary Committee against the federal legislation, it was not surprising that the head of the Association of Jewish Studies, Pam Nadell, who uh, was mentioned earlier, and other academics and the president of Pan America, who's also Jewish, joined me in opposing the legislation. On the other side were Jewish organizations, including the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Want an example of the danger? The UK did adopt the definition for application to the campus and Israel Apartheid Week there was canceled. Now I'm no fan of Israel Apartheid Week, but it's political speech and giving the government the power or administrators the incentive to chill or suppress speech does great damage. And not surprisingly, the Simon Wiesenthal Center applauded the canceling of this campus event and suggested every other university should stop it too. Such actions also propel the idea that Jewish students must be protected from hearing these types of expressions, that they are fragile. In my view, the campus should be the place for students to be disturbed by ideas. Students are gonna be disturbed by ideas for the rest of their lives. Why not think through how they might digest such things in an environment that gives students the freedom to try out ideas and be wrong? Let's talk a little bit more about speech on campus and who's invited to speak. Invitation is an endorsement. It's an opportunity to look at ideas. That doesn't mean that one cannot speak out about ideas you find troubling or even bigoted. A few years ago, J Street invited me to speak after some J Street U students were supporting efforts to deny a platform to Steve Bannon at the University of Chicago and Charles Murray at Stanford. The students said these speakers were engaging in quote, verbal violence and should be barred. I told them about another better approach. I mentioned that Iranian President Ahmadinejad had been invited to speak at Columbia, and since his invitation went through the proper procedures, he was allowed to speak. But the administration there reached out to me and others to plan for what to do. Ahmadinejad's Holocaust denial was well known, but I suggested that when Bolger spoke, as he planned to do before Ahmadinejad, he also mentioned his anti-gay statements. And then during the question and answer period, Ahmadinejad said Iran had no gay people. It wasn't clear if he meant that they killed them all or if he really believed there were no gay folk in Iran. But because of all this hard work, Ahmadinejad's talk was a disaster. And then even the subject of a New Yorker cover and a Saturday Night Live skit. I also told the students about an armed neo-Nazi march that was supposed to happen in 2017 in Western Montana, threatening the Jewish community and human rights activists. I told them of a Project Lemonade response I helped with getting people around the world to pledge money tied to how long the potential march would last. The money would be donated to things the neo-Nazis detested, like police training on hate crimes and security for the Jewish community and the like. Ultimately, the Nazis didn't march, perhaps in part because they would have been raising for these things that they detested. So I suggested why not put in the work and find ways to trip up these speakers, or even better, with Bannon, have them raise money for lawyers for immigrant children at the border. But no, they preferred to try to stop speech rather than to turn speech on its head in what I believe is a much more effective way, in a way that's also supportive of free speech and academic freedom. There's another dynamic in this whole debate that's illuminated by the emergent field of hate studies. The first chapter of my book looks at how we are primed to see an us and a them. Evolutionary psychology shed some light on this. Rationally, we're more likely to be harmed by a car than a spider or a snake but think of the different emotional reaction we have to each with our brains formed millennia ago. Social psychology teaches a lot too. I could take this audience divided in two by flipping a coin and when each group A and B form their own identity, even though everyone knows the assignment to one or the other was totally random, each will think of itself as better, smarter, and more attractive. That's just how human beings are. Brain science now can put people in an MRI and show how our brains react differently to pictures of people of different races. We see in us and in them, we're primed that way with our brains from when we weren't sure what danger was lurking over the next hill millennia ago. The us-them paradigm changes our thinking, especially when there's a perception of conflict. 
We also crave certainty and simplicity and prefer black and white thinking because it's easier. Social psychologist Jonathan Haidt also notes that when we see things in moral terms, as many do about Israel and Palestine, morality both blinds us and binds us. Symbols have power here too. Just think of the recent debates about Confederate statues. On those campuses where Israel-Palestine issues looms large, the Israeli flag can also be a powerful symbol. And I have stories in my book about the Israeli flag being torn down and also people literally draping themselves in it. Hate studies allows us to take a deep dive into how we think and feel when our identity is tethered to an issue of perceived social justice or injustice. And not surprisingly, in my book, there are examples of each side of this campus debate claiming the others are virtual Nazis. The irony of this, the sad thing, is that the campus is the ideal place to have difficult discussions about this issue. We must stop trying to censor others, some pro-Palestinian folk by disruptions and academic boycotts and pro-Israel warriors by emails, phone calls, and most particularly law. So what should we do? First is we have to embrace the complexity. In my book, I have a chapter that looks at the competing narratives on Israel from a general Jewish perspective and a general Palestinian one. And one of the people I asked to read an early draft told me I had an important decision to make, which narrative to put first. I chose the Jewish one, but I put a long footnote at the end asking pro-Israel readers how they would have felt if I had started with the Palestinian narrative, being in the land and far outnumbering Jews and then Jews arriving from Europe starting in the 1880s and removing their ability to control their lives. Imagine if I had prioritized that narrative and brought in Jews as secondary characters. But that's precisely the complaint of many who champion the Palestinian cause. Their narrative is not seen as a primary one, if at all. I have a couplet in my book I really like. It's a request from a Palestinian group to the Iroquois Confederacy, a group of American Indian and First Nations in New York and Canada. The cross is an important part of Iroquois culture, and they were supposed to take part in an international tournament held in Israel. The Palestinians said, don't come. Like us, you're victims of settler colonialism. Don't betray us. And I follow that with a paragraph from Judea Pearl, a scholar from UCLA whose son, journalist Daniel Pearl, was beheaded by terrorists years ago. Pearl says, for those who claim Israel is a settler colonial state, name one case of settlers moving into a country they perceive to be the birthplace of their history. One case of settlers speaking a language spoken in the language before the language spoken by its contemporary residents. One case of settlers whose holidays commemorated historical events in the land to which they moved, not the lands from which they came. One case of settlers who do not name towns like New York and New Amsterdam and New Wales, as really towns are not New Warsaw, New Berlin and New Baghdad, but after names which those towns were known in ancient times. One case of settlers who narrated their, narrated their homecoming journey for 80 generations in poetry, prose, war and daily prayer. And I point out that in many ways, Israel is like a settler colonial state, and in many ways it isn't. And I quote a scholar who says, quote, real history is the ability to navigate all these views at once. The rest is communal advocacy. So what else should we do aside from being real students and teachers and resist the temptation to retreat into the comfort and simplicity of black and white moral terms of communal advocacy? We should teach full semester courses on anti-Semitism, which I do, and I have a model on the center's website. Once we get around to questions about Israel and Zionism in the last third of the semester, the students can have a rational discussion if they have, even if they have starkly different points of view. I've had students with IDF soldiers and their families, Muslim students who are fervently connected to the Palestinian cause. We also need more classes and orientations about the value uh, on campus of free speech and academic freedom. And we need to model the campus as a place for difficult discussions, examining all views, not just the correct ones. We should be insistent that there be no harassment or intimidation or bullying or discrimination, but we should underscore that the campus must be a place for students to try on ideas and be wrong, and that the purpose of college is to shake up and disturb their ideas. Pushes that insist there's, there's only one way to look at an issue where the students shouldn't have their thinking shaken up are nothing more than calls for conformity and groupthink and not what a college should do. They must rather help students become critical thinkers and develop individual agency. And we should also reject pushes that happen on the left and the right, especially in law, to prohibit the examining of ideas, whether on Israel and Palestine, critical race theory, or matters involving the LGBTQ community. We should insist on functional empathy. 
Imagine how you would feel if you were born differently. If you're Jewish, imagine how you would feel if you were born into a Palestinian family in the 1940s. Really imagine it. Last week, I spoke to a Jewish group, and one woman said that things aren't so bad in Gaza. I asked her if she'd be willing to switch places with someone there. She didn't answer me. And on campus, there are great opportunities for new classes. A few years ago, I read a story about Amna Faruqi, a Pat. Pakistani Muslim young woman who became the president of J Street University Group, J Street U. Whatever you think of J Street, there are Zionist organizations supporting the two-state solution. I found out that Anna had taken a class about the Israel-Palestine conflict at the University of Maryland. It was a simulation class. It looked at the conflict from the 1880s until the 1930s, that's before the Holocaust, before the creation of the state, before the Nakba, before the 67 war or current events. Half the class was a simulation of the Peel Commission of the 1930s. The Brits had a mandate for Palestine and sent Lord Peel to talk to the Jews and Arabs to figure out what to do. Amna and her fellow students had to take the role of one of the people who participated, a Jew, an Arab, or one of the commissioners. They had to research that person and faithfully represent them in a reenactment. And they were given roles against type. Amna spent the semester in the skin of David Ben-Gurion, late or Israel's first prime minister, and she told me, you think that was weird? My Israeli classmate was the Mufti. As much of a pain in the butt as he was, the person on her side, the Jabotinsky figure, was worse. This is what education should be. It isn't to convert people. People can have strong views of the justice of um, one side or the other and retain that, but looking at the complexities is what education should do. When I was a criminal defense lawyer, I always tried to think of how I'd prepare a case if I were the prosecutor. Wouldn't even pro, strident pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian activists benefit from looking at the conflict honestly from each side, rather than succumbing to the moral blindness that Jonathan Haidt writes about? To end, let me get back to Spokane. The people there knew the situation was nuts, like I said, and I had friends and colleagues in both camps and I was one of the founders of the Hate Institute at Gonzaga in Spokane and knew the Jewish community and the peace and justice folk quite well. So they asked me to help them find a way forward. We had about 40 people specifically invited for a day of learning from both groups about the, you know, from, not obviously from both groups, but also from the local NAACP head and the police chief and some others. I gave them about 80 pages of text that they had to promise to read about anti-Semitism, about Israel, about Palestine about Zionism, but also some of the hate studies material I mentioned earlier. So they had more insight into how and why their thinking was affected by this contentious issue. I told them they had to be honest or the day of discussion would be wasted. I also told them there would be no ad hominem attacks and that people had to promise to listen to each other. To this day, about four years later, groups are still talking and now working together. They have disagreements, of course, but they have a vocabulary to discuss them. That day of the workshop, one of the leaders of the Peace and Justice Group came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I, ne I never understood why the word boycott resonates so negatively with so many Jewish people, but now understanding how Jews have been boycotted by the Nazis and others throughout history, I get it. And a person very active in APAC came up to me and said he had to rethink some things based on a comment I had made about having debated a Palestinian professor on BDS. That professor was for it. I was against it, but I said the professor's point had to be engaged. People like me during the second intifada said Palestinians should find a nonviolent way to make their case. What everyone thinks about BDS, it is nonviolent. So in conclusion, let's take advantage of this unique place called the campus and continue to engage ideas and engage them creatively and always try to uh, oppose any effort to suppress them. Thank you very much.